Thank you again. Thanks, Peter. And then and, and we will expect you, if you don't mind, to see you this afternoon. Yes, yeah, sir. this is the second talk of our uh, presentation, is our event today. And I want to welcome the Dr. Carson from Monash University. Carson and I traveled together in the Asia Pacific and also in London when we went to Oxford University. But more than that, Carson, he's a good friend who helps the Somali community here in Melbourne. We're actually going through a survey where we're trying to educate the Somali community and there are other projects hopefully in the pipeline. But without further ado, I wanna welcome Carson and please share with us your ideas about this topic. And if there are questions, I hope you can answer them. So thank you, Carson, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Mohamed, and thanks uh, for the invitation to, to take part in this. I think it's an uh, important uh, thing to meet and talk about these, these topics that we have seen and in Peter's talk um, that connectivity is, is growing, that we get more access to mobile phones, to computers, etc. cetera. And, and my side is basically looking at the risks of that and what can we do about it. And I'm sorry that you need to hear, listen to another talk with a strong German accent, much stronger than Peter's probably, but <laughs> quite a few Germans here. Um, so I've not prepared any slides. I really wanted to keep that a bit more open. So if there, there are any questions that go into Facebook or into the chat, or I think there's a question and answer panel as well in the in the Zoom. So anything that comes up or that I can see, or maybe Mohamed can see and, and then ask yeah. in between, uh, we can we can change what I talk about and, and really talk about that. Um, so I'm, I'm Carsten and I'm an associate professor for cybersecurity at Monash and I'm also the head of department for software systems and cybersecurity. But probably more relevant is uh, that I'm the director of research for the Oceania Cybersecurity Center. And that's where I think Mohamed and, and myself, we have traveled a bit, a bit in that context across the Pacific region because that center works with countries across the Pacific islands mainly on supporting them with their uh, national cyber security and these many of these countries are very different to Somalia much smaller um, less population but also spread out a lot and but they share that the connectivity is increasing we get more cables we get more bandwidth we get more services online payments online money transfer remittances all these kind of topics we also have in the, in the Pacific region so I'm quite familiar I think with some of the things also in a very different context um but what i really want to do is maybe tell a few stories and then see what kind of questions come up and uh, and the first thing i want to talk about is is really we, we have this idea that cybersecurity means that there's these hackers sitting somewhere and they are really tech savvy people they they know exactly how computers work they can program very well and they can hack into your computers and and we kind of feel that they are much, much better in understanding how computers work than most of the people are, and, and we can't really do a lot against it. And and I would like to argue a bit that this is not actually how things work that much. I mean, these kind of people exist. We have these state-based hackers who who know about vulnerabilities that we don't know about, um, and and who can do interesting things in hacking into computers. But that's not the majority of the problems we have. And I, I want to start with a small story from the time before we had computers at home and before we had mobile phones. It was actually when I was in primary school in, in Germany. And we had telephones that had a cable that was coming out of the wall. It was not even plugged in because that was owned by which was called Deutsche Bundespost at that time, which now has been split up into telecom and other areas. So the German post office, basically, the national one, would provide your telephone and they would kind of own the cable as well. So you're not really allowed to touch it. And at that time, um, mother of a good friend of mine, when I was in primary school, she suddenly came to our home and she said, ah, oh, can I use your telephone? My telephone is not working. I need to call the Deutsche Bundespost, the German post office, to get it fixed. And my mother said, yeah, of course, so, yeah, go use my telephone and, and you can call them. Yeah, but, but what happened? And she didn't really want to tell. And, and then after a while, she she told and She said, yeah, it's, yeah, she's really embarrassed. But 
if somebody called her on the phone and explained, yeah, they are from the German Bundespost, and there's some technical issues with her phone, and they need her support in it. And the thing that she needs to do for them to test their phone is to take scissors and cut the cable. And this was, of course, a really stupid joke and scam. And But she thought, yeah, that's some guy from the German post office, and he, he's an authority in that, and, and he knows what he's doing. So she took scissors and cut the cable. Of course, she, she had no phone after that. And and that's that's kind of um, where she trusted that person because that person claimed they are from that post office and um, and she did something that that is really the principle if you think about it just rather stupid because you would know after that your phone would no longer work and you would need a technician to come to fix it mm. but she did it anyway and and i think a lot of the scams that we have are kind of on that level except that this one was just basically somebody joking around trying to just because they could do it tricking people into doing something stupid but now people do that kind of level of scams to get money like to get financial gains and um and i know personally in my um family and also friends i know a few people who, who kind of fell for these kind of scams. And it is people calling, claiming, well, in Australia, I'm from, from Telstra, and we can see from your internet traffic that your computer might be infected with some bad mm-hmm. virus. And that seems to be a credible story because, I mean, they are the tel- telco, so they can see my internet traffic. Mm-hmm. So in principle, theoretically, it would be possible to scan it for malicious behavior. Except they don't. There's no service with Telstra where they would kind of be friendly enough to call you and tell you that your computer is infected. It just does not exist. So that person will call you and and trick you into doing something with your computer. And uh, and the same is with the people claiming coming from Microsoft. And they tell you, look, your computer is providing uh, information to Microsoft, and it does. Well, it provides information to Microsoft. So, so it's a credible story that they come with and say, okay, from that information, we can tell your computer is infected. Mm. And then people don't think about, yeah, Microsoft actually doesn't provide that service. And they also don't know that my phone number is connected to the computer. And they so there's a lot of things wrong with that story, but still people are um, surprised. They are anxious about what's happening with their computer. They use it for banking and, and whatnot. So they they follow what the people tell them. And but it's and this is you don't need to have a lot of technical knowledge to do that. You need to be trained in uh, being convincing to talk to people. And there's um, it's more like organized crime rather than highly technical people sitting there. And, and hacking into your computers. And I think this is where we need to understand how things work and where things go wrong and where people lose money on mm. on these kind of scams. And then we can also start about thinking where to, uh, what can we do to prevent it? Mm. And, and that's the, that's where some of the tricky parts come in, I think. Um, um, hello, Carson. So, yeah. Uh, my name is Lee Van. Uh, good to meet you. Just a quick question. So I think a lot of people have been familiar with these sorts of things on their computer. Um, but with phones being um, the sort of primary device for, for many people and, and the first point of sort of uh, entry to secure systems like banking or for work applications or whatever else, is there a sort of approach or, or uh, a way to protect your phone from from hacking like with with computers i guess it's it's a, just a general sense of being vigilant or you can install antivirus or if things go too far you can always like um sort of encrypt your data or, or format your machine or whatever but with with phones i guess it's all either i guess it's harder to tell first you've been hacked and it's also it's um not quite clear what to do if once once you realize you've been hacked yeah, that's uh, that's a really interesting and, and good question. And 
unfortunately, you're, you're right. There's no no good way to know that your phone has been hacked. And, um, and that's probably also true for your computer. Um, but the, the problem with, with it is that the usual people just use the phone. Let's say if you, my security experts argue for multi-factor authorization. But for most people, multi-factor means it's two factors on the same phone. Mm -hmm. And that's where things get really difficult. So in principle, if you wanted to be more secure, you probably would do your electronic banking on your computer and then use the second device like your phone for for the second factor. Even that can, can still be um, hacked and, and malicious guys could, could bring it together, but, but it gets at least a bit more difficult to to do it so having everything on on a single device like a phone is is probably not the best uh, best way to do it then i mean there's there's ways you can reduce the risk like you can uh, let's say not install lots of different apps on your phone uh, there's a, a critical thing is actually qr codes um because we're all now trained to scanning qr codes right like we go everywhere, we scan QR codes with our Victoria app for checking in for COVID. And um, we scan QR codes to get a recipe for a package of spices I've bought. And we scan QR codes for, for all kinds of things. The problem is, um, while I'm human, I cannot understand QR codes. So there's some information in that QR code. So if I go somewhere and and it's a QR code I scan, and somebody has, let's say, glued another QR code on top. Um, and I think it's something else. I can be tricked into going to a malicious website or do something where either that website tries to hack my phone and install something, or tricks me into putting in my login information into, into something. So the, the problem is that there's a, a really long list of things that can happen that it's quite quite difficult to give one simple answer on what to do and uh, i mean there's there are really good websites where you can get all this information there's for example a company called uh, get safe online in the uk i think the website let me quickly have a look i think it's get safe get safe online.org it's really easy to remember and they have excellent information the problem is it's just a lot of information and and it it's really difficult to go through everything and really understand all the different risks. So unfortunately, the, the short answer for your question is there's no kind of easy fix for that. There's no antivirus software that you can install on a phone or even on a computer that would kind of detect all the different things uh, that can happen because there's always new stuff coming up that, that the antivirus will not find and even we had cases where antivirus themselves had vulnerabilities and could be exploited so it's unfortunately it's it's quite difficult mm -hmm. now uh, Dr. Kasson, I, I just want to ask you a question about one of the issues i encounter when talking about this with the, the community members is people laptop ipad pc they understand that that's a computer. In other words, it has an operating system, programs, applications. So clear definition, that's a computer. Then all of a sudden you have a mobile phone, smart mobile phone, and that link is no longer there. People don't see the mobile phone also just as another computer where you can actually have the operating system, the applications and what have you. So in other words, they belittle, they will say, well, this is just a mobile phone. So it's not really, you know, capable of doing all this hacking and what have you. Is that something you encounter with all your students or other people you deal with? In other words, is, is there a demarcation where people don't realize the mobile phone is so powerful now, it's just as good as, or even better than some old BCs? Is that another phenomenon that you encounter or do you want to talk yeah, about this? Uh, people, people do understand that it's like a computer, but I think there's a general kind of perception that the mobile phone is more secure because it's mm -hmm. less open. 
like on a computer, I can install everything I want mm -hmm. from everywhere I want, basically. On a mobile phone, let's say if it's from, from Apple, it's more controlled in that Apple ecosystem. If it's from Google, mm -hmm. Android, it's more in that. Well, I can add other app stores if I wanted to, but maybe I don't. And then I think, yeah, it's quite, it's quite controlled and then just controlling all these apps. And and that's that probably creates a bit of a false perception of of security and safety in, in that in environment. And, and we have seen there are tools that are, for example, used by police and secret services intelligence to, to hack into iPhones. And, and also Android phones. Um, so there are vulnerabilities that that can be exploited. And and if, um, let's say, the, the official organizations or agencies in our country where we might have a particular level of trust in them that they will not do it with my phone and they will not steal my money and, and that, they can do it. There's also the question whether also the the bad guys, the criminals, can make, might be able to do it as well, even if that technology is in principle controlled. But it shows us that there are ways to do it, and and I think we need to we need to have that understanding that we need to assume that some things can happen to it. If I use it to transfer my money. Um, Maybe I need to double check that I transfer it to the right person, that I don't install apps for money transfer just because they claim to be cheaper, where I don't really know what's behind. And uh, and maybe I uh, I don't transfer all my money in one one step and, and lose it because it, it was some some dodgy app to, to do it. And, and so I think we need to kind of have a bit of a understanding of the risks behind mm. the yeah. system. Yeah. yeah. Now, I want to uh, ask you, I'm getting a lot of questions, but they are related to that uh, questionnaire. We asked the community about getting some feedback, which is okay. That's very good. And I think maybe from Masita will probably later on answer those questions. But the one that I'm interested in, someone mentioned is about cybersecurity at a national level, which now reminds me about that Oxford project, uh, about the CMM, um, the majority model. Now, do you want to talk to us a little bit about this? Because a lot of people are interested, but no one really knows what is it all about. Or I think in Somalia, they've already done it, or I'm not really sure, I haven't seen the report. So can you please tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, the our collaboration with Oxford, which is now going on for a bit more than three years, I think, um, uses a model that was developed by Oxford together with, with other partners, which is called uh, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model for Nations. Mm -hmm. And and the idea is, maybe some people are familiar with that ITU, Cybersecurity Index, which basically for each country gives like a number, and mm -hmm. you can see where your country sits compared to other countries. And it uses a few indicators for that is basically like a desktop research thing to to compare the countries. So the the model that we use is not that kind of index. It's not to compare countries. It's really about um, analyzing in detail the cybersecurity maturity for that nation, and then develop recommendations that are specific for that nation, and and not for comparison with others. And and uh, there's probably two important aspects to it. So the first is, it's not just based on um, desktop research, like publicly available information. The main source of information is by talking to people, relevant people in the country. So mm -hmm. the way it works is if there's no COVID and we can travel, that uh, the team would travel to the country and would spend their most of the time four days up to a week maybe and with a lot of work before together with the government uh, we would get people together into focus group discussions and and these people are across all different areas that are relevant think uh, education 
law, uh, police, um, technical cyber security, cyber security, the computer emergency response, um, telecoms, financial institutions, etc. So we try to get really that wide overview. And then um, we run these focus groups session that are all recorded and, um, and we have a long list of questions that we go through and then we can have open discussions in it as well. And then we take all these recordings and analyze them transcribe them and then from there we we combine that with the available material like existing policies laws some countries have joined the budapest convention for example and they have the framework and regulation around that and some have education in cyber security other stone so we collect all that information and then the report is written that is probably around 150 pages of quite detailed recommendations and this goes to the country and is reviewed there. Um, before it goes also to a technical board of Oxford so that the quality is remained very high. And then the country can decide what to do with it. So we don't own that report, it's owned by, by the nation. So they can decide whether they want to publish it, bring it into their discussions in the government, act on it, uh, build policy out of it, just take up a few recommendations. So there's lots of different reactions. Samoa, for example, has published the report and basically taken up all the recommendations in it to turn them into policy and 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 that other countries are a bit slower in it. Um, and and this process has been applied to I think more than 80, 84, 87 countries all over the world. And I think Somalia has done this kind of exercise but in a remote way and they're probably in a less um, strict way than it would be possible if you are actually in the country and you can get the people people together but it's at least it's a first step and I have not seen the the report because well it's usually it's a confidential data so it was not us doing it I think it was the uh, Oxford team and the people in South Africa together doing this so that's, uh, but it's an important exercise because it can really show you where can you start with the next step in improving security on a national level, like what kind of legal frameworks you need to to even get a computer emergency response team operational, um, and and that all that kind of questions are discussed in that report. Well, well that's very very useful to know because uh, a lot of people were actually asking about this, so. I will forward that information and say, look, or probably they will watch you, what you are saying. So if the Oxford people and the South African group help Somalia, so hopefully we'll get that report published and it might also help Somalia secure its own uh, IT environment and so on. So that's very good uh, news to know. But but I think the same thing happened in South, in the Pacific region. So is that now all done? Do we know? No, it's, any... a, it's an ongoing ongoing project we have so far we have worked with uh, seven countries um, across the Pacific region like uh, Samoa, Tonga, Vanuatu, Federal States of Micronesia, Papua New Guinea, um, Tuvalu, don't know if I've left one out, Kiribati um, and and the, the goal of the of our center is and what we are funding for from the Victorian government is to do this with uh, up to 15 countries in the in the region. So this is an ongoing project, but it has been slowed down a bit by, by COVID. We have done one review online um, with, uh, with Tuvalu, which is a really small country. So it worked reasonably well, but it's, it's definitely better to do it, uh, do it in person. So we hope that next year we might be able to take up uh, more speed and, and do it in person again and now um well the, the thing is you can't do the review and then go away and say okay now you've got the report and yeah be happy with it and you go on so um countries in the pacific also need um support in, in then building capacity and going the next steps so um, we have also started doing that now so we work with the countries where we've done the reviews to um, discuss possible prioritization. So it's not our role to tell what to do and what to prioritize. What we can 
can give a bit of context and, and help in that discussion. And now we have the first few projects uh, with uh, some of the countries to, to work on specific areas, for example, cybercrime legislation or um, working with plans on using blockchain for different things. Uh, we can support them to, to really see, understand the risks and understand which platforms might be useful or might not be useful. And, and so we have all these academics from the eight universities that are behind the center can support us in that. And, and we can work with countries to, to basically look at all these different aspects. For example, the legal, legal issues of, um, in the federal states of Micronesia, some colleagues from, from law, from Monash, uh, work with them to, uh, to build a strategy and for, to build up that legal framework. And there's, there's all these, these different experts that we can bring in. So that's, that's quite, I think we're quite in a good position with the center to have access to all these people. Okay, well, thanks, thanks for that. Somalia is going through election time and hopefully with the new government, I'm sure they will be interested to know the outcome from that exercise. And I'm also trying to link them up with the, the Pacific region. So basically lessons learned, what, what can we learn from the experience from this region? But a lot of questions are coming in but they are a different thing now. People are more interested in mobile money, cryptocurrencies and blockchain and what have you. So I don't really know whether you have time, but I will try to combine uh, like a theme. Maybe I can push them to like a thematic way. So the one that basically is like 70 or 60% of the questions are about the move to, to cryptos and what's happening to money as we knew and so on. Now, What's interesting, I don't know whether you follow in Africa and, and the Horn of Africa, especially the, with the remittances now, a lot of people are moving to using the digital currencies. Now, looking at it from security aspect, do you want to share some ideas with us or are there any warnings or some areas you want to highlight? Yes, there's, there's a lot of enthusiasm about cashless and we're now going to crypto and we're all digital and so on. But from academic point of view and from Monash and the people who know more about this area, do you want to share with us your ideas? Are there any warnings and anything you want to highlight or, or anything else you want to share with us in that area, please? There, there seem to be a lot of questions about this. Yeah, it's a, it's a really complex and fascinating area and we probably could spend the rest of the day talking mm -hmm talking about it and, and it's not there's no easy answer for that so I think the first thing is is really fascinating and it's there has been a lot of very interesting developments and we have seen now over the years that um, at least the the concept of the of the digital currency based on that distributed um, structure of blockchain, has shown to be relatively stable. So it, it seems to work. So there have been no kind of dramatic problems with that principle. Um, but there's a lot of things to be considered. So, so I think the, the first very pragmatic one is that you put your money into a blockchain, um, but then how do you, how do you pay with it? Like uh, where, where do you use that kind of money? Because um, it's not that you go to a shop and you pay with your with your crypto currency. It's it, it's not accepted in many places, and it's also not not extremely practical to use. Still, it's also slow. A lot of them, and and so it's eventually you probably need to change it into a fiat currency. And that's where where the interesting questions come because the the exchange rates are extremely um dynamic and um, at the moment in many cases in the long term the the value of the cryptocurrencies went up but it also went down dramatically in between and that can happen all the time and it depends a lot on political decisions by the government so it's not only the market controlling it it can be changes in regulation can can make dramatic differences and, and you don't really have control over that. So there's, um, there's that caveat that, let's say, putting all your money into, into crypto, um, you need to understand that, that it's, a, it's a quite volatile 
market, which can change very, very quickly. Um, the second thing is that um, in order to interact with a blockchain, usually would go via some exchange. And, and that's another security issue that, that you basically depend on that exchange. Because they could um, basically access your money. It's a bit like a, you need to have the same level of trust like into your bank. But it's not the same level of regulation. And, and that is where, where things get a bit, bit tricky. Um, and, and you need to understand that uh, basically your exchange has that kind of power over your money in many cases. Right? So, so it's... Um, but that, I mean, that doesn't matter if it's kind of like your usual cash that you use, like not not a big amount of money that you put into a into a blockchain. But it might be might become a bit more problematic if it's um, basically your main uh, way to keep money. Mm. And and I mean, regulation is catching up, and there's things happening, and also some of the the banks have started in Australia have started now acting a bit as ex exchanges and and that so they try to play in that game as well but they're far from being as strong as the bigger exchanges that we usually yeah. use for that so it's it's a moving moving thing and then finally it's also there's so many different cryptocurrencies out there that is really difficult to keep track track of and there are a lot of scams in that world as well like just recently there was one that people came up with that didn't even have the mechanism implemented to withdraw your money or use it or sell it so still people invested into it and so these people made a lot of money and and then they said yeah sorry okay it's now gone because you can't actually do anything <laughs> so there's there's really interesting scams coming up, coming up as well and so uh, and it's what well, is difficult to keep informed, really. And so I don't know if there's specific questions around that. that yeah. You have. No. Yeah. See, the, 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 what happened was in the specific case of Somalia, uh, sometime back a year or two years ago, there were serious problems in, in that sector because th there were people who were abusing the word forex. You know, we know now part of the world what Forex means and their rules and regulations and markets and what have you. And it was a scam. So a lot of people in Somalia lost money through that Forex. Now then we're going through this crypto again era and a lot of people again jumped in. Now, the, of course, the difference now is with the mobile money and that Forex problems back home, they were localized. And what is the mobile money in Somalia is within Somalia. Basically, you use your mobile and the provider and so on. But with the cryptos, it's globalized. You know, whereas the exchanges are anywhere. You might be dealing with exchange in Hong Kong or Sydney or New York. And there's a cross-border payments, too complicated. And, and at the end, there's no fallback position. There's no one you can call or no office mm -hmm. you can go to. And so to me, the way I look at it is maybe the risk is higher, although sometimes also there could be some returns that God knows how it works, but some people might even make money out of this. So that's really the area we would like to know, I guess, in your case, in academia, you probably know a bit more about the technology and you understand all those problems. So if there are any ideas you can share or how do we, I guess the, the best the answer we're looking for is how do you avoid, how do you mitigate the risk? <laughs> but I don't know whether that is impossible or, or whether you can well, share the, that with that. The, the problem is, it's, it's, it's kind of the, the idea of the blockchain is that you don't have that trusted entity running it, right? It's mm. a distributed system. Mm. And, and so it's kind of built in that there's nobody to complain to if something goes wrong. And and there's no solution for that because that's how the system is supposed to work. Let's say you put money, you buy Bitcoin, and then you're stupid enough to use your lose your uh, passcode to, to 
to get access to your to your money, yeah, it's gone. Nobody will ever access it. it. It will just sit on that on that blockchain as a transaction, and then nobody can get it. And and there's no way to recover it because there's no organization where you can go to and say, look, can you please reset my password? And I want to get get that access back. But that's built in into the into the system. It's not. Um, well, it doesn't always work with the banks as well because they do other things that are risky. But uh, it, it's kind of built in, and there's no if you if you want to have the total decentralization of, of a blockchain, um, it's up to you to to kind of uh, keep on top of of that, and because there's nobody to complain to, and and also if somebody steals you your passcode. Yeah, what what do we do? I mean, that's even. If, I had discussions with with some law experts on what is actually a crime in in blockchain. I say if the blockchain is built in a way that some particular types of transactions are built into the system, and somebody does these transactions, and you lose your your money, basically, is that a crime or not? Is it just using the system like it's supposed to be, or is somebody really steal, stealing stuff? from you and mm. it's different if they trick you into kind of like changing your money into a digital currency and then they steal that etc then it be automatically becomes a crime but if it's just things that w live within that blockchain it actually gets even on the legal side it gets complicated yeah. and there's some yeah. risks in that as well mm. no that, that 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 is very interesting point you raised see i also spoke to a lot of people about this. I'm actively involved in this for different reasons. And again, from the legal aspect, the, the definition was when something is stolen, in other words, digitally, can you actually steal something? And the laws are not catching up yet. In other words, the, the legal systems are far behind the technology in this area. So the example I was given to, I, I almost laughed, but it was actually serious. I couldn't laugh. The guy said, look, if you have a Word document or a photo or some digital entity, and I take that from you, but you still have it. I have only, and I only got a copy. So I didn't deprive you. In other words, you have your thesis or your book or whatever it was, or your art that you spent years drawing. But then I got a copy. So he, legally speaking, he said nothing is stolen. You know, what is stealing? The definition of a stealing is you're depriving someone mm. something they own. I almost laughed. I said, "Look, isn't that a joke?" He said, "No, it's not a joke. That's where the law is." <laughs> so yeah, but, the I mean, that, still catching up. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, for for that example, there's now we have other laws for let's say copyright, intellectual property, uh, that kind of things in the. Well, in the digital currencies, um, if if you are deprived from being able to use that digital money to buy something, um, I think it's stealing mm -hmm. from you. Yeah. But then it's the question: you what kind of because there's no there's no contract with that digital currency. So who who kind of guarantees for that? Digital money in in some way, yeah. and and what's kind of the basis of of that yeah. that transaction uh, that mm -hmm. you might have? Like if I have uh, cash, when I mean, there's strong regulations around cash, so kind of the government guarantees that that cash has some kind of value, and and so if it's stolen, it's very clear. Mm -hmm. But with the digital currencies, is is less clear because you don't go into a contract with some entity that guarantees you that you can use that digital information to buy stuff and mm. and, and that's mm. what you get deprived from right yes and yes yes yeah well, no, no, I, I get the point but the thing is when i went to Shini, in fact we, we met few weeks ago where we, we had the coffee i used to go there and, and study and i did economics there and they used to teach us uh, echo 101 what's the definition of money and there were three or four definitions i think there were three big one definitions and you know, it's a means of exchange or unit of account and all these. And as I walk back decades later at Monash, those definitions, I think, need to be redefined now because yes. I don't think they're valid anymore. Because now the, the 
I don't even carry cash anymore, but the last time I saw a note, there's something that says this is a legal tender. In other words, it's a central bank issued and it's a legal tender and I can go back and the, the shop cannot refuse. So, you know, they have to accept and so on. Now, and if I lose it or if it's uh, if it's a torn or something, I can go back to the bank and get another one or all those other norms and, and, and possibilities. But with the crypto, if I have a, a Bitcoin, and as you said, I lose the bus code, then that's it. It's gone. So there's nowhere to go. No one, in fact, no one to call. <laughs> in <Yep. the> story. <laughs> so and on the other hand, though, it can be valuable. We can do trading. In fact, last week, MoneyGram and, and, and I think Stella, they, they, they join, they're now working together. So within the US, you can transfer money, you can do remittance using Stella. This is a new development that for the Somali group, that would be, that would have a huge impact because if we move to that level, what it means is remittance as we knew is gone. In other words, mm -hmm. there'll be a new way of doing business. So that's really an area that perhaps uh, the last 10 minutes or whatever time left, if you can expand on that bit more, what, what can be done, you know, what is, what ideas, what, what is the thinking in academia? Is this the way forward? Or do you think this is just another blip, something that we have to go through? And is it a phase we are going through or you think this is here to stay? What, what do you think? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's difficult to, to look into the, into the future. I, I think um, the, the problem with the, with the current proof of work type of blockchains is that on one hand, they are, the proof of work idea works, like you, you can um, kind of create a stable system out of a proof of work idea, but it also restricts the, the scalability of that, of that system. So it's, um, I think currently it's feasible to, let's say, go towards a remittance model where I use the blockchain to transfer, internationally transfer the money, but then at the end, people would still need to change it to fiat currency to actually use it. And then if you change it to your local currency, some of the big advantages are lost directly. You might change it to US dollar, if, you, if it's allowed to do that in the country, it's not all as possible as you know, um, then it might be more stable, but it's that kind of removes a lot of the, of the big advantages that you, that you have. So uh, I think what is currently um, still a bit future or open is the way to get to a digital currency that I can actually pay everywhere with. We don't have that yet. Actually, even in Australia, very few places where you can, can pay with currency. And, and very often it's even more like a, a digital currency crypto ATM where you just have a place in the shop where you can change it to to banknotes or digital or, or fiat currency. Um, actually directly paying with with your crypto is is not possible in many or most of the places. So I think as long as we don't don't have that and currently we don't really see how we can get there. And and there's several reasons for it. The first is there's just too many cryptocurrencies. Like you could have like a few of the big ones, my shops might go, okay, yeah, we accept that one. Um, but will they be willing to accept 200 different ones? Yeah. Yeah, maybe not. Do they really see the, and, and what do, do they do with them? Who, who covers the risks with that if you accept 200? Because like 10 of them might just disappear or uh, they suddenly become, uh, because there's some problem with the code that nobody knew about, so the value disappears. So it's it just, I think we're quite far away from, let's say, turning the economy into a, from a fiat currency based one into a cryptocurrency based one because of all these, these different questions on scalability, on, on risks and that, I don't know if you've probably seen that Melbourne University is kind of more as a publicity thing accepted um, cryptocurrency for a research project. Um, but it was like $200,000. If you look at the size of Melbourne University, the risk is 
<laughs> little, nice. small. So it's still nice to see, and still uh, they are the first in Australia to do it, and um, and it's a bit surprising for a quite conservative university to do it. But then, if you look at it, the risk is really small. If it was uh, the proposition to say, okay, you turn like 50% of the research income you take in, in cryptocurrencies, that probably would go uh, The risk is just way too, too, to do that. So so that's kind of where we are. And, and that's from the research side, we have the um, the different visions of what, what could be done. Mm. But I think it's relatively open on where we can where we can go and which models could actually work at the end. I think what we will what will stay and what will stay for a long time is having cryptocurrencies for everything where the risk of it uh, failing is uh, something that we can live with. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you, Drakasson, for that. I think that was very informative and educational. Finally, if, if the, someone from Somalia were to call you the central bank or the minister of finance or someone and I know you're not here to give advice, but to, to, to seek your reaction to Somalia moving into uh, CDBC or some uh, digital currency, what would be your reaction? And, and, and if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to share this with the, the rest of the community. So, yeah, so what do you think? So the thing is, um, if somebody would call me, I would not be able to give a quick answer. We, <laughs> we currently have a project that we just start with a country of Tuvalu to have like a scientific support project to work through options on how to use blockchain and for what and why and, and that. Mm. And I think that's that's probably the way we have the blockchain technology center at, at Monash yeah. University with the um, people who really work on the core protocols, on the cryptography, on the on all the technology inside. So we have uh, I'm more on the one level of abstraction towards using it, but we have uh, my colleagues who really uh, and, you know, Jean Chan and Joseph, and, and they really know by heart inside all the different cryptography yeah. and, and the mathematics and, and the risks and, and that. And they joined this, this project with, with Tuvalu so that we can really go to the core of it and, and see what, what blockchain platform would be suitable for which mm -hmm. application and what are the risks, how to build it. Why, why do you lose sovereignty if you move? Um, your control over your currency to an exchange that sits outside of your country. Where do you? So all these kind of questions would need to be kind of worked through a bit, and 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 so it makes sense to to kind of take these experts and go through a project and really analyze this. And it doesn't take need to take very long. It's probably an exercise yeah. that takes like three four months, and yeah. and then then there's a better understanding of where to go. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carson, for all of that. There was the Singapore FinTech a few weeks ago and the Bank of International Settlements and a lot of other people are doing very active uh, programs on this. So I'm going to share that with my community. But also I want to thank you about that uh, engagement with the Somali community in Australia. I'm getting a lot of positive feedback about that questionnaire and I'm looking forward to see the outcome of that project as well. So. I think we'll leave it there. A lot of more questions. Maybe I'll email them to you and, and maybe you can condense it and we'll share with the community. I think we'll leave it there. But if you have any last word or something, over to you, Kassam. But I really want to thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mohamed, for, for organizing this and, and inviting me. I, I think this kind of connections and community um, events are, are really important to, to really understand what's, what's there and what, what we can, can do together. And um, when I'm, if there's anybody, let's say from Somali government or somewhere interested in, in things like the CMM or other um, activities, um, I can also create the links to the Oceania Cyber Security Center and to the people there and also to get the right people in South Africa, maybe in Oxford on board. Um, so if there's some interest, uh, please reach out to me and I can probably create the links. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are a lot of people watching this, but I'll also pass a message. And tomorrow, there's uh, Professor Cheryl Saunders is joining us from Melbourne Uni, who will also mm. talk about Somalia and so on. And for your information, we actually have two papers today to be presented. One of them is about an NFT project. So the Somali artist is moving into NFT, and there is another paper or someone is giving a talk on, on Bitcoin, the idea of using <laughs> crypto coin 
for uh, homelessness, solution for the homelessness in Somalia. So interesting things are happening. I'll keep you informed and you're quite welcome to join us later on and also tomorrow morning if you have time. I wanna thank you again on my behalf and on behalf of the Somali community here and back home. So thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, great pleasure to join. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Okay, well, well, we'll continue. You're welcome to stay. We, we, I think we'll have a break now for 10, 15 minutes and we'll come back normally we usually have coffee breaks in real conferences, but now we have virtual. Maybe we'll have a virtual coffee break and we'll, we'll resume again in 20 minutes. Thank you very much again, Dr. Carson. Okay, we'll see you all in 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.